Alrighty, welcome, Plan Weekly, April 15th. Uh, no team updates, big picture updates. Gabe, you're up first. Cool, I uh, just want to run through the 13.0 uh, release funding issue right quick. Um, I'll share my screen just so we can have it for the video. Um, gonna try something a little different for the project management group. Uh, instead of like listing out a bunch of things to deliver. Um, it worked really well with the Jira importer with Alexander and Yarko um, kind of storming on that and collaborating. And I think based on some of the other feedback that was in the uh, ad hoc retro put together, um, some of the engineers feel like they're on a team of one because <laughs> we just like pick up issues and work on them until they're done. So I was thinking it'd be cool to try to have just basically three main themes that we work on during this release and make progress towards. Um, one would be the Jira importer, and this would be the second uh, iteration of that, where we want to focus on uh, more or less mapping Jira users to GitLab users so we can import comments and um, and add mentions and descriptions and that sort of thing. And then the other is the making progress on the Jira markdown parser. So we have to uh, write a better, proper parser for um, moving uh, descriptions and other Jira content from the Jira markup basically to uh GitLab flavored markdown and i think we're going to use some uh middleware for that as well so those are the kind of the two goals for that um i know alexander is going to be out of the office for a while so we'll have to figure out how to keep moving that forward uh the other is sprints and tracking scope change um we've been working on the multiple tie box thing for a while and this is kind of like bringing it full circle with the smallest iteration instead of making it overly complex we just wanted to add sprints so an issue can belong to a milestone a sprint an epic um, and uh, a sprint out of the gate will basically behave just like milestones and they'll just be a separate object and then we'll iterate on them further from that point but at least it will get get things started and then also within the milestone and sprint report use tracking scope change so that's the first smallest thing there was the burn up charts so it's basically all stuff that's been in play thus far and then the third theme is longer running investments, chores, bugs, performance availability, availability issues. Um, so things like getting the real time working via web sockets, that working group, it's like a, it's a slug. Uh, Heinrich's been doing an awesome job thus far. I think he could also use some support from another backend engineer uh, from plan. And then we also have committed to working on three UX debt issues per release. Um, I don't, I, I talked to Mike Long, we can talk to Holly and Alexis. I don't know if that's three per stage or three per group. Um, but anyway, we're going to prioritize some of those and I've left that up to Holly, um, to, to kind of look at and Alexis and Nick, you all are kind of in charge of telling us what those things should be. Um, but I would also like kind of encourage us to look at the areas that we're already going to be working in terms of features and seeing if we can, like, if we're already delivering new features or iterations on existing features, let's make them better by paying down debt at the same time in those areas. Um, same thing with uh, other technical and back-end debt. Like if we can pay some of those things down, like in the milestones, we need to de remove like the deprecated um, dynamic group milestones. Uh, that would be great. Um, we also need to move some promise features down to core. There's an escalated security issue. And then uh, Donald, John, whatever else you guys feel like we need to target from uh, bugs, SLA, that sort of thing. Um, this is going to be like the third basic theme. And I think we'll probably have a theme like this will we'll be every release. Uh, and then we'll try to have like kind of two main feature themes. And that way, like eventually we can get to the point where we're kind of doing 50 to 60% feature development and uh, 40 to 50%, you know, refactoring, paying on technical debt, that thing until we get that back in line. So that's my update there. I don't know if any of the other PMs want to run through there sections and talk about it really quick feel free yeah, to put it I was gonna say I like that format Gabe um, I'll update my section and I'll push an update to the template we're using for this for next month I think that's a good breakdown cool uh, um, yeah you want to just scroll a little bit for me yeah <laughs> perfect cool um, yeah so from the portfolio management side uh, we're gonna keep moving or moving some of the problem validation and a little bit of solution validation for epic swim lanes and epic board just to kind of get some more of that on paper and some more concrete details. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, as well as try to wrap up solution validation for these two items, which are expanding filtering on the roadmap and 
hiding, collapsing the milestone view. Um, so you can have a cleaner picture when you want to screenshot your roadmap or reduce the, reduce the size of the milestone down. Um, as well as some design items, which is, you know, uh, setting up the ability or designing the ability to set static dates for the filter or for filtering a roadmap instead of having just an infinite scroll. Um, and then uh, some updated air epic parentage information in the sidebar, just how it's displaying. Um, it's not consistent across all the different views, depending on what level you're at. We want to fix that. Um, but from features we've been wanting to concentrate on, um, continue the competitive epics um, and get that to an NPC. Uh, hopefully we can get um, uh, assign, updating the epic parent via the drag and drop in the epic tree through um, bulk adding epic assignment on the issue list um, and that new epic creation page. And then we have the critical refactor tech debt bug items that um, John um, and Donald uh, recommended. Um, that I, that, like I said, I'm going to move into a, a, this themes like a, a game has here. That's good. But um, that's what we've got right now. Uh, Mark, are you on the call? I am on the call. I'm frantically trying to get my section sorted out, which it's not yet. But um, <laughs> right, talk us through it. I can talk through real quick. I mean, there's there's three real you know priorities to talk about priorities um, in terms of threes. Requirements management. Can you iterate on that? I mean, I think we kind of know that we're moving forward on that. We need to come up with a solution for um, trying to figure out how to uh, link requirements to other objects. I know there's some great ideas that have been thrown around. I want to try to you know have a spike on that and really nail down what we want to do on the linking i have a phone call with matt gonzalez actually because he's curious about how to link these things as well i guess he's looking at it more from the idea of linking testing back to requirements which i know we've talked about so i'm curious to hear his thoughts and if his team can you know help us in any way shape or form on that as well so there might be a collaborative design session there which would be great uh the second major theme for us is is usage data collection um as a pm i'm flying blind i know gabe has limited information i know keenan's worked really hard on his dashboards um but there's really no metrics collection right now for blocking issues or related issues, which is a big hole. And requirements usage is our North Star for Certify. So we need to ensure that we can track, you know, requirements created. And then down the road, we want to be able to track, you know, interactions with requirements. So that's sort of the second major theme is getting that all lined up. Um, and then really the third thing is going to be sort of a technical debt refactoring. We want to make sure we prioritize, you know, any bugs that we have in the backlog. We want to get those through. I know there's been a push to help a couple other teams out who are way behind on their bugs as well. I don't know what the status of that is. I don't know if Keenan and Gabe have heard much more about that. Um, but if those come down the pipe, I want to make sure we have a little bit of bandwidth to, to provide assistance if necessary. And just make sure that we don't have any you know, critical refactoring we need to do on our side, um, just to make sure that we're continuing to prioritize those engineering metrics as well. I know there's some measurements that are being done to determine if we're getting through you know, usage um, and whether or not we're, our availability numbers stay high. I know that that's a big thing. So I wanna make sure any issues that are, that are related to that, we're prioritizing in some capacity as well, just to make sure we're covering all our bases. So that's sort of the three major things I was working toward for 13.0. If anybody has feedback or comments, I'll have the issue updated in the next couple hours and, you know, we can discuss. I'd, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, shift things around if there's, if there's good reason. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, that was it for me. Uh, did, Donald, did you want to verbalize any of your feedback on this item? Um, yeah, so we discussed it in our meeting yesterday on the project management side um, and decided to go with three main themes uh, for 13.0 uh, just because it works out well primarily with we have six backend engineers. I um, figured could have two uh, backend engineers uh, focused on each theme. Uh, we have three front end engineers at a time, or at currently. Um, so we can have a uh, front end engineer dedicated to each theme. Um, it, I don't know if it works quite as well, especially if we're thinking about doing three themes for portfolio and three themes for, uh, for certify. Um, that'll kind of spread people thin and we won't get some of the value uh, that Gabe talked about around um, collaborating and working together on, on these themes. Uh, so does anyone have any thoughts on how many themes we should try to commit to for uh, portfolio and certify? 
I mean, I'd be totally open to the idea of doing like one major theme and then like sort of like what you call minor theme, like the, I just want to make sure we don't lose the bug fixes and the performance improvements and the availability ideas as well. I, I don't want them to get lost in the shuffle with, you know, us pushing so hard to get some of these um, business critical type things like compartments management, Jira importers, like those types of things tend to bubble to the surface. And I want to make sure we're not losing the, the rest of the work. Yeah, that's a good point. Gabe, you want to talk through a little bit around your ideas with like 60% feature or just throwing out a number um, like 60, 40 um, for deliverables versus bugs and some of the backstage um, issues? Yeah, sure. So um, I think this is kind of going and looking at everything that we have in our backlog. Like we have, and we're going to always have ongoing chores, like moving things to core stuff that comes up, random SLA things, uh, technical debt that we need to take care of performance availability issues. Like that's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, and I think the goal is, is like right now based on the MR throughput that I was looking at over the last several releases, I think we were having around 25% features. And I think we're still getting better at labeling things between backstage and feature. Like if it's part of a feature epic, the MR is then make it a feature, not backstage. But, um, targeting getting about 60% of all the MRs and issues that we push through to be uh, feature related or enhancements or like improvements, to things that will drive customer value. Um, and then uh, the other like 40% are things that are gonna help us improve our ability to drive customer value in the future. So paying down technical debt, uh, clearing the defects in the backlog, um, Ongoing investments, like we've been working on the the migrations of mentions so that we can have a notification center, which is like a super long running thing. Just those things that aren't gonna produce a lot of fruit right away, but we need to take care of. That's always gonna be there. So basically looking at our, our kind of throughput streams in that kind of ratio driven way. So that's, is that what you wanted me to explain, Donald? Yeah, that is helpful. All right, so I don't think we need an answer. Um, primarily, Keenan and Mark, as you um, move your uh, the kickoff issue over to more theme based, um, we can kind of work through how many themes we think we should take on for the 13. No. Cool. Anything else on that? Otherwise, over to John. All right. Uh, yeah, you probably read this already, but for the benefit of anyone watching the call. Uh, yeah, we seem to have delivered a lot or will deliver a lot, touch wood, in uh, 1210. So I'll riff off some of them. So we have requirements management, the first version of that, your importer, the first version of that, health status of epics. That's as well as setting health status on issues, which I believe made 129. Um, some iteration of burn up charts, hopefully, and more. Donald, you probably have, I have a, like a back end and full stack bias, so I'm probably missing a couple. One that would jump out at me would be the ability to reorder discussions and issues. That's awesome. Um, yeah, a few things I'll narrowly miss as well. I mean, that's normal uh, in a continuous delivery environment. Um, so to me, this feels like a huge achievement, like a step change in our. Uh, process we've had months in the past where we haven't delivered anything for a group and this just feels like we're delivering a lot of stuff so yeah this is a sanity check to make sure it's not just me and that everybody else is happy and that also um yeah maybe just to bring exposure to the to the fact that this seems like a real achievement and also to talk about what made it so and what um what can we carry on in future from this Yeah, one thing to call out that I found interesting is I don't think our velocity um, was really went up in 1210. Um, I think some of it may have had to, like the things we delivered were very visible, tangible things that we can add to our release post essentially. Um, so I don't know what that means if we did a better job of prioritizing, if we did a better job of um, iterating or um, cutting scope for some of these things so we could deliver something within a milestone for everything. Um, 
but I just thought it was an interesting point that I, I really don't think our velocity went up. It just, but it, like, like John said, it, it, we delivered on a lot. Um, we can include a lot in the release post, which is, which is awesome. Do you think I was super should... excited about it. Um, and I think everyone did a really fantastic job. And I think that's the kind of, to your point, it's, it's not that people did more work. It just, I feel like we worked on fewer, like there, I felt like there was less fragmentation. Um, so like with the Jira importer specifically, you know, we, we kind of had a high level breakdown, but then we iterated on it quickly and uh, made trade-offs as we went. Um, and I felt like there was really good communication and collaboration there in a way that like I hadn't ever felt like since I've been at GitLab in terms of like working a few engineers and a designer and, you know, um, me working towards like a common goal um, to ship something in a given release. And that was really cool. Um, so I, I, why I think it worked is like we were focused on an outcome and we were willing to trade scope. Like you should always be, if you're in a fixed time box, you should have to like make trade off decisions. But we committed to shipping something no matter what. <laughs> and I think it was really awesome. So I'm proud of everybody. Yeah, I mean, I'll second that. I think this was a fantastic release. I really felt like it was a, a, a well thought out um, plan and execution. And I think people really took that into account. And I, I was really happy to see people. And I think I, I'll echo what Gabe said. I, I think I was really happy to see people instead of picking up lots of little tasks that didn't necessarily all work together. We, we focused on a theme like requirements management or the Jira importer. And we made sure that everything we were doing was focused on that theme. And when there were other tasks, they were brought up and, and we were, you know, we were able to disposition those as yes, we still need to do that or no, we can, we can push it. And what that ended up doing was giving us a very focused build with the focus on the delivery. I, I think it worked really well. I was, I was really happy with how things went this, this release. So yeah, kudos to the team. It was, it was excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I echo all that. It, it, this is a great release. Um, we moved a lot of really important things forward and out the gate. Um, we should be really happy with that. Can I just uh, ask the two UX people on the call as well, like if this milestone felt different from your point of view and whether it was better or worse? It definitely felt different for me. Um, I would say that it was not ideal for me and that I would have liked to have had more time to do research and uh, think through things a little more thoroughly, but I felt like I had more time with the developers, which was great. Um, and we spent more time collaborating as a group, which I loved. I really loved doing that. It takes more time, but it was more synchronous collaboration. So I felt like we were able to move things along a little faster. So I appreciated that. I was just, I was excited to see, I think some of the work in portfolio management has been there. We've been working on it for a while and it's been, you know, it's been getting released, which is really exciting. And a lot of collaboration in MRs back and forth, working on things together, which is, but um, yeah, I think Jira Importer was definitely a, a change, which is an exciting change as everyone's seen. Just on this as well, like part of the, so one of the changes, if you like, that we've made to speed things up in future has been to keep uh, reviews and maintainership reviews within the team. And now there's uh, an MR from Jean, one of the other engineer managers, to actually make this part of the kind of process company-wide that um, we have domain, was it domain expertise in reviews as a first choice. I think we'll still have reviewer roulette. So they'll still be sort of shared code ownership. But, you know, as a first pass, you pick somebody who you know has domain expertise, better quality reviews, faster reviews. Um, so maybe that's something we learned that other teams have learned independently as well. That's really great to hear. Um, were there any like specific insights or like areas where it was like, I don't know, any other things we kind of can glean from that or? From that? From just like how it worked this, uh, this release. Um, in general, yeah, that, well, that's the question I was asking how it was for other people, you know, like, um, I think from sort of back end engineering point of view, um, when it came to things like the burn up charts, if we needed answers to a question, we knew where to ask and that might seem obvious, right? But it's, 
Um, mm. You can have two or three people working on this with different ideas of a different experience of what a burn-off chart is and does and has done in their you know, past or in their experience, right? So to understand exactly, and it's possible like there's a lot of written material on this that they could read through in the issue, but you know, maybe they like, maybe it just like you've seen these issues where there are hundreds and hundreds of comments and the, the discussion evolves over time, right? And so you have to kind of take the entire thing in and then figure out what the outcome was for yourself and that kind of thing. So the, the fact that we had a channel where people could ask questions of the PM and the EM and just keep themselves unblocked was, I think, very useful. In the end, we ended up cutting even more scope than we originally intended from the burn-up charts. And I think, as far as I'm aware, it's still at risk, but it's a hell of a lot closer than it was when we um, were in the middle of the milestone and weren't sure you know, where it was and what was happening with it. Great job, everyone. All right, uh, let's move on to workflow, Gabe. Uh, yeah, so I was trying to read through the everyone's contributions to the ad hoc retro. Thank you for those that did comment and try to pull out some of the things that we wanted to take away from that. I think we've already talked about one of the bigger ones, which is working more from a thematic standpoint, planning standpoint, an organization having dedicated Slack channels and a few engineers collaborating on a given like theme in a release. I think that's a huge one. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I didn't know if there was any others that we wanted to talk about, but it would be great to think through some sort of shared goals that we could work towards um, and feel good about. So whether that's us trying to get to being to working on 60% features or reducing the the defect rate or some sort of like performance metrics or just things that as a team we can align behind is like we're also working on north star metrics from a proxy point which will become something that we'll talk about together as a team and drive towards improving um but i just wanted to give space for folks to weigh in on specific things that they recommended changing or improving based on all the comments there So I need to go back and, and check where the discussion is now, but the main one that stuck out for me was the comment about um, feeling like we had six sub teams of one instead of one team of six people. And that's the kind of thing that I've been um, trying to look for ways that we could uh, mitigate that in future. I think the themes thing is a really good idea. Not only does it help with that by putting more than one person on um, a particular theme, but um, it sort of reduces the context switching and makes it easier to track things that are in progress. So yeah, like from that point of view, I think anything we can do to build, build in support into our process for engineers as they work on stuff. And that usually comes from one being available and two having more than one person on each individual thing where they are kind of solely responsible for it. Um, I think if we could co like conquer that, it would be um, pretty much a good outcome from this. Yeah, I agree that I think that would be the the big one. Um, and then to your point, Gabe, I think also adding um, or aiming for um, providing a little bit more direction on how much time should be spent working on those themes um, or product deliverables versus some of the other stuff that, that we do. So aiming for like a 60, 40 uh, split. Um, I think that would be, I think that would be helpful also. Do you think it would be worthwhile to at least like, instead of looking maybe at velocity, if we want to move more towards Kanban, looking at lead time and cycle time is things that like we, Product, I wouldn't say productivity, but ways that we can identify bottlenecks in our process and improve them. Um, would that make sense to kind of switch to that? Is like uh, the, how we 
figure out where we should focus on improving. So kind of aiming to um, aiming to have that that week long uh, cycle time um, of getting it from ready for dev to or from in dev to verification within a week. Essentially. Sure. Yeah. Whichever there were always there's always one biggest constraint in a system, and it's going to change over time. But it's it's basically like it would enable us to look and see which parts of our process are the slower ones or the ones that take longer, and then we can figure out as a team how we want to improve processes there. Whether it's like breaking things down smaller, providing better like you know planning and stuff up front. Like there could be all sorts of root causes, but it's a framework that lets us at least identify those bottlenecks pretty easily. I like that because I think it really ties into um, into iteration um, and enables us to uh, to be a little bit more deliberate with how we break things down and how we iterate and how we cut scope. Um, so I'm all for making that a little bit more of a formal um, aspiration uh, for us to get to. Cool. The other thing that I was, I guess, I took away from this that might be helpful is if um, I don't know the feasibility of it or the best way to facilitate it. But I do think it's would be valuable for engineers to speak with customers more often. Um, because like I'm in a, like I, I, I talk with sales folks and prospects and all sorts of people all day and I hear certain things. And I want to make sure that like the engineers and designers understand, like have that context too. <laughs> and so I don't want to waste time on like fruitless things, but I also think it's important to, like that everyone has a unified like understanding of who we're selling to, who's buying our products, whose problems we're trying to solve. Um, and so I just, I didn't know if engineers, we wanted to like kind of make a little more formal process around and in, including engineers on customer calls and that sort of thing. I was wondering that too. I mean, I made a conscious effort in the last customer call I had to invite Donald. I know it was outside of John's working hours, but just so that he could hear the resource management discussion we had. I don't know if that was useful. If you'd like to be invited to more of those, any feedback on how that went? Because I'm very open to doing that. If you think there's benefit there, I'd love to be as inclusive as possible. Yes, I think it is extremely valuable. Um, primarily uh, just to see like for engineers to see how their um, the things that they build are used by a customer, um, and then to hear firsthand um, like some of the the pains that customers are going through, or some of the the things that customers like is always valuable to to hear again firsthand. I mean, I think if I can get lead time on those calls, that one I didn't have much lead time on, but if I can get lead time on those calls, I'd love to put them out there to the engineering managers, and then feel free to forward them to you know, appropriate folks that you think makes sense to invite because I absolutely agree. I mean, I think it's, it's really critical for them to hear the firsthand accounts of the customers and to see the discussions we're having on a daily basis about what the customer expects from features, which may or may not correlate to what we necessarily understand them to expect. And I think there's, you know, resolving that disconnect is, is a huge step forward in a lot of ways. Are those calls something that can be recorded? Because sometimes the, the time zones don't really work well with a lot of the European time zones, with the US time zone and so on. You know, I would love to ask that question more. I know with requirements management, it's difficult because we are working in more of a regulated space. Um, I don't think I've included engineering on any NDA based calls yet or non disclosure calls. Uh, but as we move forward, you know, sometimes there are actually a residency restrictions as well. So I will do my best to ensure that, you know, it's as open and, and you know, inclusive as possible. And if we can record them, I think that's fantastic. Cause no, I completely agree. It's, it makes it very difficult with time zones. So whatever we can do to get those, um, even if they're for internal use only, which is probably what they'd end up being. I think it's incredibly valuable if we can, if we can ask the customers that question. I also know on a lot of the calls that I'm on, they have um, Note Taker, which is the Zoom bot for Chorus AI, and all those, uh, at least for the sales calls, the Chorus AI calls are definitely recorded. And so um, I'm wondering if it makes sense to just create like a Slack channel, just specifically where you like post 
a meeting that's coming up and then people can say that they want to join in the thread or something. Um, yeah, and then we can follow up and attach like a, a recording link if we have one or something to that same thread. So it's like super clean. There's not huge conversations, but you can always go find conversations and recordings and that sort of stuff. Yeah, we can do that or also maybe a team calendar, um, like a cust like a plan customer call team calendar um, that we can just like how we use our GitLab team calendar. Um, I don't know if that would be helpful at all. I created that. It just was hard. I guess I didn't, wasn't sure how you add, because I'm not the one who schedules these most of the time. It's like random people. And so if I can figure out how to add that calendar to the thing that's already scheduled then that would work. But that's just why, like it, I created one of those shared calendars, but it was a little bit wonky to figure out how to get it populated correctly. So, well, yeah, let's start with the just creating a Slack channel um, with all of those, and then we can iterate on it. Okay. Any other comments? All right, Keenan. Okay. Yeah, so I was just curious with, um, you know, the expanding epics on roadmap and the current state, it seems like we, we ran into some funky behavior once we got the first pass of it out and we didn't have full expansion. I just wanted to ask the question just from a kind of like do a quick retrospective on it. Like, is there anything we think we could have done better or what are maybe some of the complexities that um, are on the engineering side that maybe UX and product and anybody else watching this call might not fully get? Um, just wanted to open up a conversation on how we're feeling about it and maybe is there anything from the product or design side we could have done to um yeah uh, avoid some unseen items that came up i don't know if yeah. i don't know if the right people are on the call to ask that question but it's kind of one that's been on top of my mind last day and a half. sure and um, we can go oh go ahead no you please first yeah. um so i mean there's there's kind of two parts to to this there's um just with expanding epics in general, we're starting to see some um, issues when we view, especially with GitLab org, um, when we view at scale. Um, so I think some of the, the wonkiness that we're seeing um, and then some of the wonkiness that Gabe mentioned here around uh, them not opening up, which I think Keenan, you put a you had a comment and calling is looking into that. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the issue there may be because actually I don't know if it's because because it is filtered down to a label. Um, so that one's weird. How it's just an issue that we're seeing on production um, that we're not seeing locally or through staging. Um, so there's that part. Then there's the other part around. Um, not having expanding epics for like for the entire tree in this first iteration. Um, so maybe we talk through how that was, um, how there was um, miscommunication, I think, or how just how that went about. And Keenan, you were pretty involved, I think, in the uh, process there. So maybe if you could talk through um, maybe just talking through the feature and how it came about and the review process. And all sure, that. yeah, I mean, you know, this one's actually predates me quite a bit, but was a, a fairly necessary add to the roadmap. Um, Cause one, you know, the idea of a couple different use cases, the roadmap needs to tell the right story to the right level of user uh, or consumer. And sometimes that's very high level. Like we just need big bucket parent items. Um, you know, if you're communicating to like uh, business leader, director, somebody doesn't need to know the minutia, say, hey, here's the big project. It's lasting this long as we're at. Um, for other conversations, you need more information. You need more granular idea, ideas of the work and the sequencing of the progress. So you need to be able to expand that parent epic out on the roadmap so you see the children epic under it and how they land on the timeline and individual progress. So uh, the expected state was, the like uh, Gabe kind of mentions, was how the epic tree works where you should be able to expand it all the way down. Um, and, 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 you know, to be honest, when there was a, there was a demo of it and that's the first time I realized, oh, it looks like we're only expanding to one level. And so I think, um, maybe I missed something through the, one of the conversations in the past and maybe that's why I wasn't aware of that. 
um, or maybe the requirements just weren't as clear as they could have been. You're okay, bro. Um, and so that's when we kind of spun up a different issue and said, hey, like this is actually what we want to try to get to. Let's make sure we have clarity and let's try to move that forward, which I think is is happening now. It's in depth now. But um, yeah, I mean, I think part of it for me, I think is, you know, like my GDK is down right now. So part of that's on my side, but I think maybe earlier demos of function might help with some of these big tent um, items or, you know, early like initial NBCs for functionality. Maybe that can help answer some of these questions and get earlier feedback. I don't know. That's one thing I've been thinking about too. I, to that end, I really liked uh, Kong, I guess, um, in the Jira importer on an MR, he recorded a video of yeah. different stages of the thing. And so that was helpful for me because I didn't yeah. have to spin something up locally. I also mm -hmm. noticed like Scott Stern sometimes puts GIFs on his MRs, which like showing the interaction and the behavior, which is also helpful. Um, I think one thing that that's like interesting to me about this is that we have the Epic view and the Epic tree on that. Um, and then we have the roadmap and like the, the way that I, I guess have always envisioned this, like you don't need the Epic tree and the roadmap necessarily. Um, like you want to have information about an Epic, but you could also like it, interact with that via like a roadmap type view. And that way you don't like duplicate functionality, I guess is what I'm getting at. And it feels like we're duplicating the same thing on the Epic view that we are on the roadmap. No, I mean, it's, I, I understand what you're saying. There are two different use cases that use the same information though. Like the Epic tree and, and I don't want to take this call on use cases, but if we find it, we can talk through it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the Epic itself is the collection of work. It's looking at the bucket. It's, fairly agnostic of time, right? The roadmap is looking at that similar information over a span of time. And like, we do see different needs for this from customers in the conversations. Like it's, I need to plan the work, I need to put the work together, I need to fragment it and create issues, I need to organize it. And then the roadmap is about displaying it, looking at it over time and having the ability to get more granular as you need for different audiences. And so, yeah, there's some duplication there. But um, I mean, when, when you talk about reporting on multiple artifacts, you're always going to have some level of duplication of data because there's so much data and they're all connected in the right ways, but you're also going to need to look at dependency mapping, which is going to be really difficult to do in an epic list view, but you need that same information to map it over a timeline. Um, so I, get, I, I get the, it seems like there's some duplication of view there, but it's, it's, a, different, it's a different view of the data for a different, a different problem. Yeah, that aside, the performance things that I guess I see it, the, right now, I feel like they would be negated if we just showed the top level epics by default, right? So like that's what you load first. And then um, since I only can see so many on a given page, like we could easily paginate that as you scroll vertically to load more top level epics in. And then as soon as you hover over the expansion view, we can fire off the whatever it's called where you, I think we're using GraphQL the roadmap, but um, it's the optimistic fetching or whatever, um, where like you, you actually request the data on hover instead of on click. So that way, by the time you click and it expands, you already have the data, um, for like the, the children epics. And that to me, it seems like if we look at how many top level epics we have, we could calculate performance implications for that. Um, no, I agree, but, agree with that. I think like having a collapsed view to start like we do with the epic tree is the way, the way to go. Yeah. And I think that's what we're aiming for in this, uh, with the latest issue. Um, not so much the pagination or filtering or lazy loading, because uh, that's something we still have to figure out. Um, I think we still have an issue on the UX side of that. Um, but as far as just showing the top level epics um, and then allowing uh, the expanding of sub epics um, a la uh, epic tree. I think is what we're working on now. What are we doing? And like, I've noticed this, one of the big feedback items we got from our most recent NPS survey was performance. Like we got a lot of dings um, and detractor scores for performance <laughs> of the application as a whole, not just like plan stuff, but like merge requests and all sorts of different things. Um, and like, what are we doing as part of our development process slash, you know, go to market, pr get stuff ready for production to test scalability of features as like we've implemented them. Cause there's a big difference between like developing something locally with the smaller data set versus, you know, developing something 
that has uh, an enormous amount of, uh, I guess, a larger data set. And like, how are we, are we doing anything proactive to look at the performance of that at scale, like load testing before we just call something done, done? We do. Uh, we don't do load testing before we we release the feature, but um, there seems to be like an effort. I'm not. Uh, I'm not totally au fait with this, but there seems to be some sort of effort to um, run load testing against known features, parts of the API, for example, that we then get issues uh, with severity labels attached to, based on the performance of that part of the application. Um, a good example would be um, Heinrich re recently fixed a problem where on merge requests, it was identified on merge requests, but I think it's applicable to issues as well, where the, as the discussion went up, the, you know, the, the number of comments on a discussion went up, the um, response time went down exponentially on higher loads, right? Um, so, and yeah, like, I mean, he got in and fixed that and sped it up. Um, so yeah, like in answer to the question, I don't believe apart from what we've been trying to expose, which is uh, graphs and Grafana pages and Kibana logs on performance parts of the site and how they perform now and then give engineers the ability to check that after they ship the feature. I don't think there's anything formalized to do load testing before we release a feature. What about any other sort of like tracing or, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not an engineer. I just know back when I was building Ruby applications, we used New Relic and we would instrument that and the engineers would use that as part of the sort of development process to check their code for performance issues, at least that, that they could find. Um, and then there was always stuff that you can't find until it's live and in the wild and at scale. But is there anything that we could do to help catch some of these things proactively instead of retroactively? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I know what you're saying. In New Relic, you would have the ability to know pretty quickly, like, um, and you also get to see how much of the request is um, application layer, how much is database layer. Um, I don't think we use New Relic anywhere in GitLab, but we do send stuff through Prometheus um, and visualize it in Kibana graphs. We also aggregate logs in Elasticsearch cluster and make them queryable by through Kibana. Uh, I think that's limited to seven days though. Um, so we have like a lot of data and we've just come through a period of performance training um, with a number of members of the team. It's just um, maybe we could be better at surfacing that data. It's always gonna be retrospective though or retroactive until we figure out some way of building performance into the development process, not just making people aware of how things perform already. That said, if you look at the, um, what was the epics thing we did where there was, um, so Charlie worked on the counts, counts and weights, right? Cumulative counts and weights on epic hierarchies. Mm -hmm. So that was shipped like as not, it added a feature, but it also improved the performance hugely of the the kind feature that was already there so i mean there is an emphasis on performance um but we, we just don't have any way really to retroactively or sorry not retroactively to to do load testing as part of the development process at the minute that makes sense um what about sorry i'm just asking lots of questions because i'm curious about this um using things like uh, profilers locally to look at you know your database queries and your memory usage and like overall times for different stuff just as like that could be one way that we could do that um, it's not uh, like at scale necessarily but at least we can maybe start to like think about it proactively and start to see like if something's already get a little bit slow <laughs> locally it's gonna probably be really slow when when it's at scale um, I think you can do like you can do a lot of that with what comes out of the box in Rails. I mean, you in the logs you can get a fairly good idea quickly of um, what part of the application is slow or what part of what you've built is slow and why, like how much time the application spent in uh, in the database versus in the application layer um, and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, we could add profilers. I'm not sure if there are any. Maybe Alexandra, you could you could let us know. Like, I'm not sure. 
uh, if there are any already built in, but certainly just using out of the box tools, you can get a decent idea. Well, the, there is some, like in the logging from the rails, you can get some, some feedback already, how much time it is spent on the queries, but like, I'm not sure how feasible it is for like in development to do these load testings. It, it does sound like a next step for, or an iteration on the feature development itself. It's like you're, you're building a feature with uh, performance in mind. So building the architecture and so on. And then that sounds as a next step to let's test how much load it can actually sustain um, rather than uh, doing this load testing as you develop the feature. So that, that, that's what my thinking is that where I'm standing with it. And you can and pull like, down the project as well and run it locally. And you can run like load tests locally, but if we put yeah, that but in. That, that, but the first, like a lot of the stuff you'll not be catching and it does involve spending time and trying to catch something that you'll not be seeing anyway, uh, other than in a like bigger data set environment, so to say. So, well, it, it, does, it does have a lot of aspects. You, you need to, to generate all of that data set, then how accurate is that data set generated that you're doing? Does that have all the data that you're going to? Because like you can set, generate a huge data set, but it will still pop that the, the problem will still pop up in on production because of the um, the kind of the data that you have there. Um, so like here I'm thinking, for instance, let's say I'm, I'm thinking right away for uh, parsing, for instance, the the descriptions of the jury issues or, or something like that. So you cannot really prepare for all kinds of information that you get there. Yeah, you can prepare for counts and amounts in that sense, but not for the realistic data. Um, yeah, I, I think it's very specific to the issue that, um, to the to the feature that is being developed. Um, so yeah, and in this case, this very specific tree view of the epics, yeah, that's that's probably something that uh, we could have taken more time to to invest to, to create deeper levels of of epics and 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 kind of try to test it this way. Um, yeah. I think that's helpful. <clears throat> I think we're at time, so I don't want to keep everybody later than we ought to be. Um, but I would be interested, John and Alexander and any of the engineers, just to think about things that we can do proactively that don't add a ton of unnecessary overhead. Like I don't want to do busy work or wasted chores, but I do agree sort of like what Alexander was saying is like designing with performance in mind from the beginning is would be helpful, especially now that we're getting larger, both on .com and some of our self-managers starting to be very, very large instances with lots of people on them. And so performance is going to come increase the, yeah, an important I, thing. I, sorry, one more thing though. It's like when, as we, we develop a feature, maybe we should um, from get-go have an issue that says, let's evolve any performance implications. So at least uh, we know we're thinking about that and we're not just going forward without at least paying some attention to that and, and see what the implication might be. Um, and then maybe something surfaces that, yeah, well, these are the, the cases that we should look at and see how it performs uh, in these specific situations or something like that. Yeah, I've linked in the agenda, the performance toolkit, which anyone can clone and run um, 5K, 10K, 25K uh, tests against I guess any feature, like if you're prepared to write the script to do so. Um, but also linked uh, an example of the issue we get from the test group um, when something just doesn't work as quickly as we expect it to. Cool, thank you. Cool, and then we talked about the password. Anyone else have anything else? Great, well thanks everyone. Have a good Wednesday. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. See you. Bye.